So Lorna, to begin, I know uh, you've been preparing for the interview and reflecting on your time at the museum. So I wanted to give you sort of the floor at the beginning to tell us about how you came into this role and a bit about your time at the museum broadly. Oh boy. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I joined the museum in 2004. Um, and it was, uh, it was just the perfect opportunity for me at the time. I had always wanted to be manager of a community museum and the Red Deer Museum was quite interesting to me because it had an interesting collection. It had a history of doing kind of challenging, innovative exhibitions. And when I started, there, they had begun the planning process for a new building. And that was the, the ultimate hook is that I thought I was going to be uh, helping to plan a new building. The new building project fell through. And I guess most of my time here, uh, I spent addressing, uh, Colleen uh, Jensen was the um, director of community development at that time. And when the building project fell through, she called me in and said, okay, so what's plan B? And for the 17 years I was at the museum, I really was working on plan B. And plan B was to really make the museum as vital and engaging uh, as it could be, and to address the changes. So in 2004, Red Deer was quite a small city, about 50,000 people. And by 2006, 2007, they were predicting that its population was gonna double in the next 10 years, which it did. And so we were in a transition from being a community museum that served people that had lived here for a long time to being a museum that was gonna serve people who were new here. Um, and at the same time, census data came out and showed that the majority of the population in Red Deer was uh, under the age of 40. So again, what, what that told us was that was young families, and so their needs were really kind of different than, uh, than an older population. So that was kind of, that was where we started from. Um, the building, when I came in 2004, the building was already um, in need of some repairs and some changes, and uh, we worked on that. So um, in 2009, 2010, we did a major interior renovation. So we pulled out all of the, uh, the old exhibitions. We insulated the walls. This was a brick building. And when it was built, um, insulation and vapor barriers weren't really part of the building code, but it was essential to keep our climate controls inside. So, so uh, we did that. And at that time, so when we did our, um, when we were closed in 2009, 2010, we set up a satellite museum at the mall, at the Parkland Mall, and we surveyed our, our visitors to find out what they wanted. And at what, what they told us at that time they wanted was big blockbuster exhibitions. So what we did was we designed one big exhibition space so we could host major exhibitions. Um, as we went down that path, however, we found people saying, but, but we want to see local history. We want to see the history of of Red Deer too. Uh, so um, with Red Deer Centennial coming up in 2013, uh, we kind of backtracked and uh, worked with Michael Daw, who was the archivist, to uh, use half of our exhibition space for a permanent exhibition that told the history of Red Deer and, uh, and the other half for temporary exhibitions. So, um, so that, was, um, that was kind of the trajectory we were on uh, there were lots of highlights along the way. You know, um, we uh, continued that tradition of, of kind of socially provocative ex exhibitions by doing a, an exhibition called The Unmentionable History of the West. So we worked with Nancy Miller, who's a, a, an Alberta historian, and she had written a book called The Unmentionable History of the West, which was about a women's history of the West. And the fantastic thing was that our collection was really able to demonstrate a lot of the issues that she talked about, the issues of, of contraception, uh, marriage laws, um, not to mention underwear. We had, we, had, uh, we had a panty line that had underwear from every decade, and we were well able to, to demonstrate that. So, so it, that was really fun. Um, but in keeping with the, the kind of um, socially conscious idea that the museum had pursued, um, we invited uh, uh, community organizations to come and talk with us about what were the contemporary unmentionable issues. 
Um, and based on that, we were able to bring in an exhibition on domestic violence from uh, the police museum in Calgary. At that time, uh, Red Deer had a, the horrible statistic of having one of the highest incidences of domestic violence in Canada. Um, and the Humane Society uh, came and made a presentation. So those community groups created a satellite exhibition to the unmentionable history of the West, which was about contemporary unmentionables. Um, and we had, in the washrooms, we had posts where people could pick up a card with uh, information for helpline. We trained all of our staff, so if people revealed that they were in need of assistance, uh, they knew what to do. Uh, so it was, it, that was really, um, for me, it was really one of the highlights to show what, what we could do with taking history and bringing it up into the, into the present and making it um, relevant to a broader community. Um, so after our renovation, we, um, our first big exhibition was David Moore. So as we were renovating and we had these big white walls, David Moore kept coming and saying, oh, this is perfect, this is perfect. And he had done this series of very large, beautiful landscape painting. Um, uh, so we, uh, that was one of our first exhibitions that we hosted. Um, but. Uh, we were also able to bring in a major exhibition from the National Gallery of Canada on the history of Cape Dorset. And again, one of, the, one of the beauties of our collection was we had the Swallow Collection, and she had collected Inuit and First Nations art from very, very early days. So the beautiful thing about that exhibition was that it put our collection in context. We had some of those same very early prints from Cape Dorset that, that the National Gallery had. So. Wow, <laughs> you know, that was kind of validation. You know, and I think, and that was, I guess that was one of the other motivations that we had uh, with the museum was um, people in Red Deer tended to compare ourselves to Calgary and Edmonton and to think we were kind of lesser than. And yet there were collectors and artists and history makers in our community that weren't, it didn't need to be compared with anybody. They were they had strengths of their own, and uh, I think that was a really uh, one of the really powerful things about the museum. Um, after we opened Remarkable Red Deer in 2013, we launched on a whole series of uh, special exhibitions, um, and uh, they were all so incredible. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to think of um, a favorite one. Um, uh, you know, we, uh, we hosted uh, a retrospective of Joan Cardinal Schubert, and she was a, a First Nations artist who grew up in Red Deer. She, she uh, maintained her roots in Red Deer, so that, was a that one really resonated uh, with the community. Um, I guess the, the other uh, really watershed moment was walking with our sisters. So um, an artist named Christy Belcour had started this project uh, to honor the uh, missing and murdered Aboriginal women. And uh, she launched a project called Walking With Our Sisters. And I had heard about it on the radio and tried to track her down. And one day the call came back uh, to say that there was an opening and we could, we could host it. And that exhibition really was a lesson in community engagement. Her requirements were that we work intensely with the First Nations community here, and uh, we did for for a year in preparation for the for the um, exhibition of Walking with Our Sisters. But it taught us so much about community engagement, and it was such a powerful statement. Um, you know, we. Um, when we uh, we started the project, we didn't really understand the implications of it. And as we got deeper into it, and as we we launched the project, and there were so many people that came, and uh, so many aspects of it, and uh, one of the, the requirements for that project was that we had to have a group of elders who were like the keepers. They, they treated the exhibition like it was a, a medicine bundle. So they were the keepers of the bundle, and every day they would come and smudge it and care for it and pray. Um, and, 
at a certain stage in, in the process, we just turned over the keys to the museum and gave them free access whenever they needed it to, uh, to come or to bring, to bring elders or to do whatever they had to do. So that was the, for me, that was the moment when, when we really solidified that relationship with, uh, with that community. We also did uh, Hiding in Plain Sight, which was an exhibition about the uh, Métis people. And again, this area has a very rich Métis history that was really unknown. And so using what we learned from walking with our sisters, we, we had community meetings and uh, quite considerable community engagement about uh, Métis history. And we ran that exhibition when the Canada Winter Games was on. That was a really, because that was sort of a national, uh, a national group that we could identify um, and, you know, lent itself to lively music and, and uh, performance. So, um, so that was, um, that was quite a successful project as well. Um, I guess in the meantime, we, we were building our art collection. And again, Red Deer's kind of caught in the middle between Calgary and Edmonton. And although we have a, a quite a strong arts community here and a very strong craft community, they really weren't known here. There really was no opportunity for them to be known. Their commercial galleries, just didn't have a market here and curators tended to look at Calgary and Edmonton and if Red Deer was mentioned it was always just kind of an afterthought. Uh, so we started um, doing some exhibitions of local artists. We did an exhibition, a retrospective of James Agrell Smith who was probably one of Canada's best wood engravers and really unknown outside of Red Deer. Um, we did um, an exhibition of fine craft and ceramics. Uh, Trudy Gawley, who's one of the faculty at, at um, Red Deer College, had a retrospective. So we tried to do a series of retrospectives of, of some of the local artists. Um, and like I said, when Dave Moore kind of did our inaugural exhibition when we reopened after our renovation, and uh, to my delight and awe, one day he came to me and offered to donate to us whatever we wanted from his studio. And so that began uh, quite a, an incredible process of documenting his work and uh, spending days and days in the studio with uh, Mary Bethel Violette, our guest curator, and, and selecting what we would uh, bring into the collection. And we brought over 200 of his works into the collection, everything from early, early sketchbooks to drawings to some of those major paintings that we exhibited in that first show. So uh, that was, uh, was really um, fabulous. Um, on the First Nations front, like I said, we did um, Joan Cardinal Schubert. Uh, we did an exhibition from the Alberta Foundation for the Arts collection of First Nations art. Uh, and then we were approached by Patrick and Marissa Mitsuing. And just out of the blue, we received a proposal to do an exhibition on powwow. And um, after a little bit of trial and tribulation trying to contact Patrick, because he was on the powwow circuit and we couldn't get him, um, we met with Patrick and Marissa and they told us their vision of wanting to exhibit the best regalia of the seven main dances that are performed at, at powwow. And it was just too good to pass up. It was such a, after walking with our sisters, which was very dark, it was, uh, it was a grieving kind of exhibition. Powwow was such a celebration. And it was such a, an opportunity to do something that museums rarely do, which was to commission the regalia so that we knew the maker of, of the pieces and we knew the meanings of the pieces and we knew the dances that they were meant to perform. So, um, so we, we organized Ochiwen Powwow, The Origins, in the midst of the pandemic. <laughs> so we decided we would just keep on going and hope that uh, we would open and we opened uh, at a time when we were in lockdown. So we really 
missed the opportunity to, uh, to really celebrate it. Uh, but we were able to, uh, to open it to the public after the, some of the restrictions were lifted. Um, we worked with uh, Patrick and Marissa to host a powwow here in Red Deer, and the exhibition has now traveled to St. Albert. And, uh, and we're working with them on our second powwow. <laughs> so that's just been the most fabulous um, collaboration. Patrick and Marissa are, are um, kind of brilliant at social media and uh, so passionate about powwow and all things related to powwow and all of the uh, art that, that's involved in it. Um, that they've just been inspiring all the way around to, uh, to work with. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about the fish? So uh, the koi uh, were part of the original concept with the building when it was first built, and Morris probably told you about that. And uh, I think originally they had an outdoor pond and it was soon obvious that um, in wintertime that wasn't gonna work. Uh, when we renovated the building in 2010, we also renovated the fish pond and uh, we sent the, the fish uh, to be, uh, to have a foster home at the Kerry Wood Nature Center for the year and a half that we were renovating. And when we brought them back, they spawned and we still have a couple of their progeny in the, in the pond, but some of them are very old. So they've been here since I, more than 17 years. So, so they're, they're getting to be old and wise. <laughs> They've seen lots of changes at the museum. You should interview them. <laughs> That's excellent. That's a great um, overview. Okay, so I was looking through the old newsletters uh, beside Kim's office and your welcome letter from 2004 is saved there. So I have a quote to read, your quote from 2004. It says, museums have been my passion all my life. And one of my lifelong goals has been to work in a museum that has a dynamic role to play in its community. That's exactly what I see when I look at the Red Deer and District Museum. And so I'd love to know, sort of when you came in at 2004 and your expectations, you've talked about not getting to build a new building, but um, was it what you expected when you took on the role? Well, it was interesting because I had, uh, I had huge shoes to fill in Morris. Morris was a very prominent uh, figure in the community. So I guess, uh, guess there was that. Um, I think um, the most interesting thing to me was that the community itself was in such transition. And, uh, and the museum was, had been such a vital part of the community in the 70s and 80s. And then for various reasons, you know, funding, funding, fell short, various things happened that it was kind of uh, dormant. And so, um, like I said earlier, the collection is broad and deep. There's just some fascinating stuff in there. Um, there's a community-wide interest in history, um, but that wasn't always evident in, in what people could see and do in the museum. So that was the real opportunity that I, that I saw was just, it, it was, um, it had all the parts, it just needed to activate them in, in a different way. You know, and I think because I had so much experience in, in large museums and in project management, that my vision might have been bigger. Like, you know, that, that thing of, um, when we surveyed people, they said they wanted us to bring the world to Red Deer. And, and I had some of the contacts to, to start that process. Excellent. So I'm interested to know, because this is a museum and an art gallery, the unique challenges that come with that, and also some of the opportunities for storytelling when you can do both at once. Yeah, we, we changed our name like partway in. Well, yeah, I, I guess there's parts of, part, big parts of the story I missed there. Uh, we changed our name from the Red Deer and District Museum to the Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery um, because um, 
a large part of our changing exhibitions were art exhibitions, and that was that was already in practice when I when I came here. So, you know, every year the museum hosts the uh, Red Deer College Visual Arts Department um, graduating show. Um, we we had a, a history, a long history of hosting important art exhibitions. So it seemed important to name that aspect of it. In addition to the museum aspect, which was, was again, to document uh, the past history of, of the community and the people that lived here. Uh, you know, and I think museology at that time was also changing. So um, I didn't necessarily see a big divide between um, social history and art history. They kind of were, were inextricably linked in my in my mind and by having both of them under one roof it gave us that opportunity to kind of look at at what was you know the 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 holistic view of the community and and how that was affecting the artists in the community you know like um, James Edgar Smith is such a great example so he was a brilliant wood engraver um, but he was a postal worker that was how he supported his family and yet there were local stories of, of people who knew about his artwork and, and about him making his wood engravings on the kitchen table and printing in his kitchen. And, you know, and then uh, right now the museum is exhibiting Jim Westergaard. Jim Westergaard is also a wood engraver. And he and James Elgro Smith were in this community at the same time, but they never met. And, you know, and, and just some of those coincidences uh, are really intriguing to me. Uh, and I guess in having a kind of a more expansive view of the community and history and art, um, they're all part of the fabric of what makes us who we are. Excellent. It's, it seems to offer a lot of great opportunities to, to have them yeah. together. Yeah. So these are some um, collection specific questions now. Over the years, the museum has provided a unique opportunity for community members to physically interact with objects from the collection. I'm thinking about um, the discovery room and the collections in there and the edu kids. So I'd love to know your thoughts on the balance between protecting objects and artifacts and also letting people interact with them and how you manage that. It's always the push-pull in museums. And, um, you know, I think to me, the most important thing is to inspire in young people a passion for, for history and art, uh, to make them passionate visitors of museums and galleries, um, to um, inspire them to create art. And so, um, you know, in a museum like ours, we have 100,000 or so artifacts, and not all of them are perfect. And... Uh, many of them are duplicates. And so it would seem to me that part of the work of those artifacts is to teach people about their, their utility, to help the past resonate in a physical way um, with, with particularly young people, but we know we've also had programs for, uh, for people suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's. So um, the artifacts have work to do and uh, they don't all need to be precious things behind glass. Some of them uh, can certainly um, serve that other purpose. You know, and things like the threshing machine behind me, it works. It, thre it can thresh wheat. And uh, on rare occasions, we have had it fired up and, and put it to, to work doing some threshing. Again, just to show people that process, that's the, it was made to go. It, it wasn't made to, to be under glass in a museum. It was made to be a working model. I was just, when you said to show process and thinking about how with the artist collection you were getting sketches and sketchbooks, is that something that's important to you? In yeah. Collecting? Yeah. yeah, you know, and I think to try and get inside the head of artists and see where their inspiration comes from and to show that it's, it's not... Um, they just don't emerge fully formed and one day paint a painting. You know, that you work, they work out their ideas. Um, with David Moore, you can see his, you know, the, the things that captivated him all the way through his career. 
and you can see him developing how he how he sees. That's that's so important. Excellent. That also makes me think about. Uh, it's clear that this has been built for families and children and students. And you talked about the collaboration with the Red Deer College. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, on how you make this space accessible to college students to exhibit their art and also to, to families. Um, I'm a big believer in alternative education. I was someone who hated school for most of it. And I really see museums as having that creating that opportunity for a different kind of learning, you know, um, for kinesthetic learning, learning by touching and feeling and moving, um, for intergenerational storytelling. So having uh, objects and stories that, that may strike a chord with parents or grandparents to tell stories of their own heritage to their children. Uh, so, um, I think that's that's really been a big part of it is is looking at many different ways of learning, many different ways of telling. Um, you know, I guess all things considered, if if I had this exhibit to do over again, it would be more touchy feely. It would have music and more more kind of um, oral kind of sound a soundscape to go with it as well, um, and more, um, more explicit kind of games and hands-on. Um, I would really love, love to see that, but everything isn't always feasible. <laughs> that's a, I've got a whole list here of questions I want to ask you about the permanent exhibit, so that's perfect. And so when you led the redesign in 2011, what key values were you trying to communicate to visitors? Um, I think we really wanted to get across the um, the idea that Red Deer has a very unique history in Alberta. Uh, we wanted it to be engaging. Um, one of the things, like at that time, so more than half of the population was new here. Okay, so one of the, one of the things that we really wanted to do was to make sure that uh, when newcomers came to the exhibition after they had seen it, they would feel like they were part of the community, that they would understand the, the street names like Gates and Bauer, um, and that they would appreciate the kind of unique history that, that the community had. So um, we wanted it to be accessible to children. Uh, we wanted to have open spaces like this so that we could have um, storytelling or events uh, as well. So. Uh, to gather groups of people. Um, we had the theater um, and it was showing uh, movies. So the Capitol Theater was a, a theater. All of the, the buildings represented were actual buildings in, in Red Deer's history. Not all of them are still standing, but the Capitol Theater was running short films that related to the history of Red Deer. Uh, the Castle School was uh, an important landmark and we have a wonderful toy collection, so it was the perfect, uh, perfect place to exhibit some of our toys. Um, but yeah, just to uh, to make people really uh, feel that they belonged in the community and to understand some of the people who who were um, contributors to the to the community as it is. And so, since you had worked at the Glenbow and the National Gallery before this, did you bring pieces of that? those institutions with you, or do you think this is needed a whole different sort of approach? I guess you always, you bring, you bring what you've learned. And my, my roles before coming here, so I, I was um, head of education at the National Gallery, head of programs at the McMichael Collection, head of programs at Glenbow. Um, and I was a project manager for permanent exhibitions at the ROM. So you kind of, big museums are, are kind of different because they're so unwieldy and staff are, work very much in their, in their areas of expertise. And the beauty of a small museum like this is that we can do everything. We can, we can, um, 
we can engage all of the staff in, in pursuing things that are of interest to them. So it's a pr tremendous learning opportunity for staff. They can, can take a risk into, a, into areas that they are not so familiar with. Um, we can have guest curators. So there, there were lots of um, aspects of working in those big institutions that I, I could bring here. And, and I had my network of people that I knew uh, that we could refer to if we had a, a challenge or if we wanted, you know, um, one, of the, one of our early popular exhibitions was the Winkworth Collection. So that was a huge collection of Canadiana that was donated to the, uh, the Archives of Canada. And one of the conditions of that gift was that it be shown across Canada. And I happened to know the exhibition coordinator from the archives who contacted me to see if we could host it here. And it was one of our most popular exhibitions to see those rare drawings and paintings from the early exploration days. It was fabulous. You know, and that was, uh, that was certainly um, something that was, was quite exciting to do was to see how we could bring some of those treasures to right here in Red Deer. I'd like to ask you more about the staff, since you sort of spoke about that. Morris was telling us how that people work here for 30 years, 20 years, 15 years. I'd just love to hear about sort of the, the back end of the museum, what the staff energy was like, how you work together. Just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, we had a, 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 we still have a very long-standing committed staff. And I think there are real benefits to that, especially with, with a collection with such depth and intensity. Um, and they were all people who had a strong commitment to the community, uh, who knew stories, who knew people who knew stories. Um, uh, so I think that was, that was certainly a strength of the museum. And because they were all individual, they all have been individuals who um, didn't hold back in terms of engaging with the community. So they often volunteered for other organizations as well as, as working here. So I think it really built those, those bonds with the rest of the, the community. You know, and I think by having a staff who are here for quite a long time, they, you kind of see the, the threads of their interests and, um, you know, and they are, were able to make links between things that weren't, weren't immediately apparent. So from a sort of institutional history perspective, were there big changes in how the museum was run, the different positions within it during your time here? Okay, so here's the story. So when I started here, uh, the museum was governed by the Normando Cultural and Historical Society, Normando Society. Um, and so the Red Deer and District Museum Society had one seat on the board of the Normando Natural and Historical Cultural Society. Um, which was really problematic when we were trying to fundraise because when we would go to the table and say, we need funding for this, all of the other agencies would hide under the table to say, no, 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 can't do that conflict of interest. Uh, so it was very challenging for the museum to raise funds or to obtain grants. Um, up until 2008, the museum was also the governing body for the Sunnybrook Farm Museum. So just like on the Normando Society, so on the Museum Society board, there was one seat for the president of the Sunnybrook Farm, Friends of Sunnybrook Farm. And again, that just created so much conflict because it hamstrung Sunnybrook Farm and it hamstrung the museum because if the Sunnybrook Farm had a liability, the museum had to cover it. So um, part of my role, I guess, was organizing separations. So separating the Red Deer and District Museum Society from the Normando Society so that we were autonomous and the, the, so, society, the Red Deer and District Museum Society was the governing body for the museum. 
and then severing Sunnybrook Farm so that they would be autonomous, so that we could really focus on, on what we had to do. So, um, yeah, those were several long years of negotiations for sure. But I think the clarity uh, was certainly worth it. Um, the, it gave the Museum Society uh, a, a better role in running the, the museum, and it enabled Sunnybrook Farm to develop their own plans and, and have their own autonomy. So, uh, yeah. It's such a unique position in that there's that like project management, finance, and then also the artistic exhibitions, visions for how you do storytelling. I don't know if there's a question there, but just how you like sort of manage, it's a role with so many different hats. Sort of, like. Well, that's what an ED role yeah. is, you know, and I guess um, I really saw my role as, t I, I guess I, I used a, a theater model rather than a, a museum model in terms of how we should operate, which is to have an artistic direction, director and an operations director. And that, that was kind of how we, uh, we ended up uh, doing it. So I carried the artist, I was the executive director and the artistic director um, because I really saw my role as setting the artistic direction for the organization. And then I had a, a finance and operations coordinator who, who helped with all of the day-to-day -day stuff. That's yeah. Okay. It, but it, it certainly, you know, I guess what I, what I loved about it was the diversity it, no two days were the same. There was nothing really that was routine. Um, and because we were small, what was so great was that we could turn on a dime. So when the opportunity for walking with our sisters came along, we could say, yes, we'll do it and, and adjust things so that we could do it. And uh, that happened. We were very opportunistic in, in our planning and, uh, and that was really quite exciting. Wouldn't want to do it all the time, but but it was, uh, you know, it, it certainly kept the passion in, in what we do. So I, uh, I'm going to take us back to the permanent ex exhibit <laughs> questions. And in particular, I'm interested in, I can't imagine the late nights and long meetings that went into designing this beautiful permanent exhibit. Is there sort of a, a day or a moment that stands out in your memory when you reflect on building this space? Uh, yeah, so the day, the day was uh, in November of 2011, and that was the day that City Council approved funding to go ahead with the condition that we were ready to open on March 13th, 2013. So that was 13 months to write, plan, design, build, and open. And so it was just, uh, it, it was a marathon. And um, luckily, uh, we hired Reichenpech Architects from Toronto, and I had worked with Reichenpech uh, previously uh, in my work at the ROM. So I, I, knew, I knew them quite well. And uh, they, they kind of set the, the pace. Um, and, you know, and sort of, I, I think the, the hardest moments were kind of blocking it out because we had limited space and limited resources. So blocking out the parts of the story that we could tell and the parts of the story we were going to have to, to leave out. Um, but no, I, I think the most memorable moments for me were really when we were in construction. So the, the contractor who built this was in um, Hull, Quebec. And so they built it all in their studio in Hull and then shipped it here in January. So, you know, just the worst possible time to send in trucks across the country. And they sent a crew from Quebec to, uh, to put it all together. And we had such fun with them uh, because we just had this infusion of, of Quebecois joie de vivre and, you know, and working pretty well around the clock to get everything uh, constructed and installed uh, was just, 
it was a total high. It was was absolute fun, but but grueling for sure. Perfect. It's the next exhibit question I think you've hinted at, but um, of course the museum has run many really interesting exhibits. Is it possible, or do you have a favorite? Well, Ochiwan, Pawa Ochiwan, I guess was the was the highlight. Um, I think the second favorite would be probably the Joan Cardinal Schubert exhibition that uh, we borrowed from the Nickel. Um, I, I was in art school with Joan and it was just so incredible to see her body of work and, um, and the depth and the impact it had on our visitors. I think that was, uh, was certainly a highlight. So what item in the collection do you think people will be most surprised to learn that the museum holds? Oh my goodness. Or a whole collection. I don't know what would surprise people. I think probably the surprising thing is the Swallow Collection that we have treasures of Inuit art in our collection. And, you know, as Morris was saying at lunch, it's, it, it was um, an important move on, on his part when that collection was offered to, to realize that, that we should collect it. But I guess our collecting mandate now says that we collect things that represent the history and and social history of red deer in central Alberta. And the Inuit collection is far from that. But um, it was a very, very important collection. I want to touch on that mandate because sort of in preparation for this, it's being with you, it's being with Morris, social history has like very, very clearly come through as something that this museum does really well. So I'd love if you could talk a bit about the importance of social history and how this museum has, it's like just so interwoven through everything. It's really well done. What this exhibit tries to demonstrate is that Red Deer has a very unique history and that history has uh, had a big impact on who we are in the present. Um, you know, and I think there are stereotypes about Red Deer, Redneck Red Deer is a, is a prominent stereotype. And yet, you know, when you look at the, the newcomers uh, interactive that we have here, so uh, my, my ambition with that was to show 100 stories from the last 100 years, and we got 50 from the last 50, so, so pretty good. But, but when you see the diversity of people who have come here for all number of reasons, um, and when you hear what they have to say about what it means to them to be here, uh, you get a much deeper understanding of the, the community. And I think that uh, that is what builds social fabric, is understanding the diversity and appreciating the beauty of that diversity. Excellent. So throughout your time at the museum from 2004 to 2021, did the collection policy, not necessarily the actual mandate, but um, the way you collected or the things you were collecting, did that shift in that period? Um, yes, um, because we were full. <laughs> so um, we became much more discriminating in terms of what we collected, much more strategic uh, in our collecting. Um, you know, I think we focused more on collecting art. Um, our collecting was, has always been pretty opportunistic. You kind of waited till things came in the door and then decided whether they should be there. Um, but we, we really became more directed in terms of looking at what aspects of the story do we want to tell, um, who's story are we telling? Uh, is it representative of the stories that we intend to tell? Um, 
is it the best example? So uh, we started to, to just be much more selective. It's kind of heartbreaking when people come to you with their family treasures and you, they say, you know, we think they belong in a museum and we have to say, no, sorry, we can't, we can't take them. That breaks your heart. But, but that's what we had to do, you know. And I think with this collection, um, refining it so that it really is excellent is one of the, the important tasks. Um, so that it does become a, a valuable research tool and a noted, a notable research tool for people uh, researching prairie history. So as we do this sort of institutional history of the museum, of course we can't speak to, to everyone who has worked at the museum. Are there key staff members who have left a big impact on the museum that you'd like to to talk about? Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, everybody who, who worked here worked here for a long time and had a big impact. Uh, you know, I think I would certainly mention Wendy Martindale, and uh, she has passed, but she was the director in between Morris and me, and she probably had the toughest job. She took on the role of director of the museum when funding was at its absolute worst, uh, when the, the, the community was kind of in a, in a slump, and, uh, and she did her very best to, to carry on. And she, and she also created a, an exhibition which toured nationally on, uh, about wedding gowns. Um, so uh, she certainly made, made her mark. Um, Valerie Miller was our uh, collections coordinator, and she worked here for 30 years. So she had a very deep knowledge of the collection, a, a strong passion, strong passion for it. Um, uh, she certainly knew the community very well. And uh, Rod Trentum was our uh, education coordinator, and he retired. And again, Rod has the most amazing mind he is, is the, the um, polydidact <laughs> that he just had many, many different passions and interests and many um, insights into the history of the community. Excellent. So I'd also love to know about when you have all these professionals, how you managed the team, how you brought them together and your values on sort of leadership in a museum setting. Um, I guess my intention was always to have a very collegial, non-hierarchical uh, environment. Um, I really um, wanted people to go deep into their areas of expertise, but I also wanted them to test themselves in other areas, um, to take on different roles on those teams. We were a very small organization, and that was one of the challenges. We were totally flat, and if, if one, one person was absent for one reason, we all felt it because, because there was no one else to hold up their, their part of the, of the workings of it. Um, so I think, um, I think ultimately we had a very strong team and you probably saw that a very cohesive group of people. You know, I saw it during COVID when, when they, you know, the, the leadership team all came into work, uh, and, uh, found ways of working together and solving, solving problems and listening to each other and learning from each other. Um, I think that uh, that's very, very important. And we were actually talking about that off camera, so we should ask, we should ask that again, but how did the museum adapt during COVID? Um, we did the best we could. I mean, what we, you know, and I think the strength for us was that we, were, we had behind the scenes work that, that could go on. And, you know, and I think that that was the, the real strength of it. And, uh, you know, and I think um, Lynn and Carly worked out ways of uh, having our, our art classes go on Zoom. 
Um, so having a social media presence and, and uh, an online presence that, that we didn't have before. So that was a huge learning and, you know, and it was just sort of um, seamless. Uh, the, the brilliant uh, happenstance that happened during COVID uh, was that uh, just before the, the, the pandemic was declared, uh, Carly and Kirsten had attended a workshop on developing social media for your organization. And so their assignment in their workshop was to develop this social media plan. And when they came back, we were into lockdown. So they just implemented the plan. <laughs> like <laughs> they, were, they were just ready. So uh, that was just, uh, you know, good luck, really. And, uh, you know, and wonderful that, that they were all willing to to kind of uh, work within the constraints that, that were presented. So what was, from the very beginning to, 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 to now, what was the biggest challenge that you say it could be what you faced or the museum more broadly faced? You know, funding is always a challenge, um, but you know, uh, but to that, I would say that the city of Red Deer was always a very generous funder. I think we were well, well supported. It's never enough. I mean, there's always more you'd want to do, but, but I think that uh, that was a struggle. The I think the facility was the it was the thing that held us back. You know, because. Uh, because the collection storage was such a, it's such a labor intensive, such a huge daunting task. And it, it becomes this obsession because you, you can't stop part way through and you have to still create exhibitions. Uh, you know, you still have to do all the, all the other work. You have to do all the front of house work, but that, that was kind of the all consuming background for everything and and that was the the enormous challenge it, it's a it's a wonderful challenge if you've got the staff and the facility to be able to do it you know um, certainly like all the big museums I worked in had whole staffs that just worked with their collection uh, but we didn't have that and and that that uh, became wearing on on everybody you know, and just and simple things like we we were we've always been lucky to be able to get major touring exhibitions, but we don't have the loading dock facility to unload them. So to bring things in through the loading dock, we would have to spend weeks moving stuff around. We would have to hire somebody with a forklift to get the things off the truck. It just and then we'd have to rent space to store the the shipping crates like it it that just was so much behind the scenes invisible work you know and then and that goes back to the fundraising thing is that all that invisible work is not very sexy for funders you know they want the big flash um the big you know community impact which it has community value but it doesn't have that big sex appeal yeah, yeah, and, and you know, and nobody wants to fund a storage rack. Like, it, it just isn't isn't interesting unless you're a museum nerd. Speaking of museum nerds, that's a good transition. It seems like the Red Deer Museum is very good at sort of interacting with larger institutions uh, like the CMA and other collecting organizations. How important do you think that is as a small museum to be connected to? Oh, well, I think it is really important. And, and we also are a mentor to, to the small community museums. So we're a member of Carmen Central Alberta Regional Museums Network. And so we've provided assistance to a lot of the small museums in our region with various things, with storage. We've, when we've uh, got rid of display cases or, or ver your storage tracks. We've offered them to those smaller museums. We've offered them workshops on various aspects of collections care and so on. So I think that's really important. But I think it is, uh, this is such a, a good museum to be a kind of a transition point. So for people who are pursuing a career in museums, this is a really good diving board to go to the next bigger place. Um, 
And the bigger museums have the wherewithal often to do some of that deeper research that can benefit us in terms of museology, in terms of care of collections, but also in terms of, of exhibitions. So now I think it's very important to see ourselves as part of that community. And we aspire to be a bigger museum, so. You're a, a powerful museum. Yeah. I think that's the other thing I learned today. Just the, the, the scope of what you do here is amazing. Yeah, it, like it really, it, it just is such a good learning opportunity for, for people interested in the field. I'd love to know what was the greatest accomplishment at your time here that the museum undertook? Oh, I don't know. I guess it's kind of twofold. One was the collection storage project, which is still, it, it may never be finished, but, but it, I mean, but we made huge, huge strides in care and, and documentation of the collection. Um, I think the vision that we could um, attract exhibitions from anywhere in the world, you know, we, we brought in Anne Frank from, from Amsterdam. Um, I think that also was, uh, was um, part of my dream anyway. Perfect. So starting to wrap up, uh, two of the core values of the mag are humor and fun. And I would love to know more about how those ended up on the core value list and why you think those are important. Um, because uh, museums are entertainment, I guess is, is ultimately it. It's that for me, the, the thing I love the best is when you're taking kids around and they, they learn something and they sort of laugh when they get it. I, I love that. I love to hear them laughing and chattering. Uh, so I guess that's the fun part. And humor, um, we're all really, all of the staff here are really committed and dedicated to what they do. And uh, it's easy to get really too serious. <laughs> and so at some point you have to just step back and um, delight in it. You know, it has to, you have to have that delight. I'll tell you my moment of delight. Uh, when we did the renovation, um, before the renovation, all of the walls were covered with Belgian linen, Morris's beautiful Belgian linen. And it was, by the time I was here, it was pretty tired. And uh, people would come through and every now and then mutter said, oh, I'd love to paint on that linen. And so when we, uh, when we closed for renovation, we had a paint out and we got all of the mist tint paints from the paint shops and we invited the community to come and paint on the walls. So the, all of the walls were covered with just extraordinary painting. And they're still there, they're, it's under the, it's behind these exhibits. It's behind all the walls, it's all there. All of that joy is there. We had, we had musicians come in and make groovy music and we just spent all day painting. It was fabulous. So you dedicated, uh, you dedicated decades of your life to the heritage sector, the Glenbow, the National Art Gallery, the MAG. I'd love to know why heritage is so important to you personally in museums. It was just something I always loved. Um, when I was a kid, so my, my father uh, was a farmer, but he was in, deep in his heart, he was an archeologist. And when he retired, he went back and got his master's degree in archeology. span And when I was a kid, we used to go around and visit people who had collections. And I, it just, I enjoyed that so much. I enjoyed uh, that, um, that things from the past could be tangible and that you could see them and touch them and learn about the past through objects. I think that was, uh, that was the driving thing for me. And I loved learning from objects. Before we wrap up, is there anything we didn't have a chance to touch on that you'd like to share? Um, I guess just to go back to the volunteers, what I, 
the biggest volunteers we had were our board members. And we had some really incredible board members who, who really helped uh, make this place what it is. And, and I, I should have acknowledged that, especially because we had, we had so many kind of big moments. So um, becoming independent from the Normando Society, um, selling the farm. <laughs> We didn't sell the farm, but but separating from Sunnybrook Farm, um, the you know the the remarkable Red Deer permanent exhibit project, the renovation. So we had board members who were so supportive and helpful all the way through all of that. So um, I guess that's one one thing I would mention. Um, what else have I forgotten? Probably a million things. It was just, it was fun to come to work every single day. 